the sermon is brought to you by the letters B and H. Brad, Brian, and John Hampton were uh, good friends in Portland in helping pull this together. So what we have done thus far over these last weeks, we started by talking about poverty as people. Not a topic, not things, but people. Looked a bit at how our usual practice of charity has a tendency to become toxic, disempowering, and demeaning those it seeks to assist. We talked about going from ministry to, or at, to ministry with. The idea that all people are made in the image of God and we do ministry with each other if we're going to make a difference. And at times, accepting that even ministry with, that's a ministry focused on solving problems, sometimes we become, we need to be people who are just being with. That we need to walk with people. People are not, sometimes it's not a problem to solve, but a, a journey to take. So what is left then in this last week before Holy Week is the practical discussion. If we say, with Nelson Mandela, that poverty is not natural but a creation of humanity and can be overcome by our actions, then what are the actions we might consider? Well, let's start with a little bit of discussion around the church and the state. Because the church and state work together on this, but they have a profoundly different goal. And that begins to show as we start thinking about how to respond to uh, poverty. The state's goal is to maintain the common good. And the most important word there is common, as in it's what we all believe in common. What what can all Americans share a belief in being a good thing? Do all Americans believe that we should have roads, schools, police, right? There's a common good that it is very good, and I appreciate it greatly, and all of those who serve it, but the goal of the, if the goal of the state is to maintain the common good, which is about what we can all agree to, the goal of the church is different. The goal of the church is to be faithful to Jesus. And that's a different thing, isn't it? To be faithful to Jesus, baptizing people in his name and loving our neighbors. And so the major difference between these two is going to be the, the humility of the state, because the state's goal is always humble. Right? The state's goal is humble because it's based upon what we can all agree upon, lowest common, de- common denominator. And the goal of the church is always going to be exalted. It's not what we can all agree upon, it's what Jesus says. And we are called to be transformed in following Jesus. So there are places the church and state can work together, but there are going to be places that we just don't have much to say to each other. And the easiest way to explain where that, how that works is... Uh, Has anyone here heard of, have you all heard of Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs? Does that mean anything? Uh, Yes, yeah, yeah, a few. (laughs) Uh, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, simply put, is the idea that you have certain needs that have to be met before you can deal with anything else. Right? You have to deal with food, clothing, and shelter. Right? If you're naked, cold, and hungry, nothing else matters. So that's the first need, right? Food, clothing, shelter. First level of need. Then the next level, once you have food, clothing, and shelter, then you need job, health, and some money in your pocket. Right? If you don't have those three, nothing else matters. Right? So first you've got to have food, shelter, clothing. Then you've got to have job, health, and some money. Then... You gotta have friends and family. You gotta belong. You gotta be part of a family that holds you and loves you and cares for you. And then after that become, is uh, having a self-respect and esteem, being respected by others, and, and finally, sort of the last of it is uh, called self-actualization, which is the drive to become the best you that you can be. The best teacher, the best athlete, become the person that you can be. And so at every step, you can't do anything higher. You can't worry about whether others respect you if you don't have a job. You can't worry worry about becoming the best parent you can possibly be if you don't have good health. So so you have to, every step, you have to have the the level below before you can worry about what's next. And the point of bringing this up is to say, what can the state deal with? The state can deal with food, clothing, and shelter. And the church can deal with food, clothing, and shelter. And we can work together on that. And that's great. The next level up, right, after food, clothing, and shelter is job, health, and having some money. 
does the state have a role in that? Well, this is where we have the issue around lowest common denominator, right? We have to all agree to it. Some of us think the state should have a role in job and health and money. Some of us don't. And so the, the state ends up having a limited role in that because we have a limited common understanding of what should be. As a church, yes, we can be involved with that. And at this point, the state's done, right? The state can do all those first two levels, but it can't go beyond the third, beyond that. And this is where the church is, is clearly called to be involved. Because the state cannot give you a sense of belonging, friends, family, people to call when you need help, right? That's where the church steps in. That's where the church can make a vast difference. That's where people's lives start being changed. That's where people's lives starts being changed in a long-term thing, right? Got to deal with the first two, right? If, if first you got to be fed, then you have to have a job, then you have to belong, and then you can start hearing about Jesus and how Jesus calls you to be part of the church. But those, those first two, the church and state can work together, but it's where the, the state tails off that the church is most called to step up and give a sense of belonging and, and a place for people to, to have family and friends in, in church. I am convinced that it takes the church to change people's lives, to go beyond merely being fed and safe, but to move into a place of belonging where people can gain a sense of self-respect and they start becoming the people they are called to be. I cannot tell you the number of times I have watched someone slide into poverty because they don't have that sense of belonging and a sense of a family that walks with them. And whether it's falling into poverty for the first time or falling back into poverty after clawing their way out, people need family and friends to walk with, to care for them, to, 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 to be there with them when they go through hard times. And if they don't have it, to merely throw some food at them is to put a band-aid on a gaping wound and say, hope you feel better and walk away. It, it takes family. It takes family, and to provide it, it is rocket science. You ever heard the phrase, it's not rocket science? Well, this actually is. This is challenging. Poverty is one of the oldest problems there is. It is a problem that is complex because it deals with social and cultural, economic, ethnic, geographic, and spiritual factors. Poverty response is a long-term, complicated trial and error matter. There's an article written, Poverty is Rocket Science, written by the president of World Vision, a Christian organization that I, I respect. And, and what they have learned is you have to be involved for the long haul and to be paying attention so you don't do any harm. Yes, you, you send food in in an emergency. If there's a tsunami, you send food, but you only send food for one growing season. Because if you send food for two growing seasons, what have you done to the local farmers? You have depressed the price of their crops, and then they can't, then you're destroying the economy that they need to be able to recover. And so to, to learn as you go, yes, school, individual, uh, communities need schools, and if you work with a community to build a school, that's great, but you also need a good governance. And this is, again, the difference between state and church. The state can get you a good, build you a good school, but it takes the church to be able to look at your local governance and say, your neighbors are made in the image of God because if the governance is racist and says half of the children can't go to the school, your community is not going to thrive. So poverty relief has to deal with both the, the, the first two levels, the food, the clothing, the jobs, but it takes a church to be able to go in there and talk about belonging and, and coming together as people made in the image of God. So Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that uh, the state can do what's in the common good, but the church can do far more, and that that's where lives are changed. Like that, That's what the basis for how we engage this. Now let's break it down into the scope. Right? If we're going to engage poverty, we can engage it at the international level, national, statewide, individual, and communal. At the international level, I can tell you that you are already doing what matters most when it comes to uh, making a difference in international poverty. You're going to put money in that plate. And a portion of that money is going to go to Methodist uh, services around the world so that when, uh, when there is a tsunami, when there's a hurricane, when there's a challenge overseas, 
the Methodist Church is already there. So you go, like you're already doing this. And uh, the Methodist Church, when it does send missionaries, it does so in a way that respects the local situation, the complexity of it. Like, I got done preaching the sermon where I said, I'm not sure it makes sense to spend 30 grand to go and do a mission trip when you could have hired locals and developed the economy to do so. And that next week, a friend of mine called me and invited me on a mission trip. And I said, oh, come on. Okay, tell me about it. And uh, it's for Methodist pastors to go overseas and to train and teach other Methodist pastors so they can be better pastors. And I got to admit, that's good, right? That, that's, that's excellent. To go overseas and to train people to do what they do better, I'm not disempowering them. I'm empowering them to do what is right. So I might be going to Africa in about two years. I'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> so in, at the international level, you're already doing something that matters. At the national level, if we wanted to do things about poverty at the national level, there are things everyone agrees on. Uh, NPR's uh, Planet Money podcast did an interview with economists across the spectrum, from libertarians all the way, uh, liberals, conservatives, Cato Institute, far right, right, the whole nine yards. And, and they asked, what can everyone agree to that would make a difference for, for poverty? This is one of them. This is, all the economists can agree on this. The earned income tax credit is great. Y'all know what the earned income tax credit is? Is there some familiarity? Yeah, here's how it works. If you make some bucks, you get a tax credit. You make more bucks, you get more of a tax credit. So it's an incentivization. The more you work, the more you get a tax credit until you get, start getting enough money where you can sustain yourself and then it starts to tail off. Olivia and I are like at the end. We have just a little bit of tax credit at the end. Am I off on that? If I'm, yes. Okay, great. You were shaking your head like I might have been off. And, okay. <laughs> I once preached a service, a whole sermon series on grieving, and there was a hospice chaplain who came to watch the entire time. It was like watching, oh, it was really nerve-wracking. <laughs> uh, so, it's the same type of feeling at moments. So, there's the national level. We could increase the in earned income tax credit and really help people who, who go back to work. We could design a healthcare system so that 62% of bankruptcies aren't caused by medical bills. We could develop an economic system that really incentivizes small businesses. Small businesses are the major drivers of, of job creation. And uh, we could do those things, but, Anyone here going to be involved in national politics anytime soon? But if you do, let me know. I'll be fascinated to give you a hand. But yeah, we're not going to be involved in that way. At the statewide level, that's where we can start to have a little bit more impact in things like supporting uh, initiatives like Tennessee did. What Tennessee did, is in, and they focused it in Nashville, is they realized that it was cheaper to give a chronically homeless person an apartment than to pay for their ER visits. One trip to the ER cost way more than one month's apartment rent. And so they, they started going out and finding anyone who is chronically homeless, homeless for over a year, here's the key to an apartment, it's yours. 85% two years later are still in their apartments and they're doing better because if you give someone an apartment then they have a place to get phone calls, they have a place to get mail, and they have a place to get a shower. And once they have a shower, then they can take a shower and, and get dressed and, and go and do a job interview, right? If you want people to have those basic needs, food and shelter and clothing, you give them it, right? And, and then they can build from, from there. So this is a, yes, we can be involved with that, but again, that's statewide politics. What we can do directly is at the individual and the communal level. And I will tell you from direct experience that working at the individual level is exhausting, overwhelming, and in the end, doesn't make a difference. Right, because I have tried, I have been there. If you try to be the superhero and to do it all yourself, you will burn yourself out. I've been there, right? It, individual level doesn't work. What it takes to make a difference in poverty, and I believe this is where the church can focus, is at the communal level. What can we do here in Shelbina? It takes focusing on the communal level, and it takes an entire church being on the same page with regards to how to treat people. Because if you start interacting with people who are in, in poverty, it takes, well, all it takes is one person to make a stupid comment, right? Why can't they just get a job, ah, right? 
to get everyone on the same page and understand, we gotta listen and understand. It takes a prolonged focus with various attempts and trials. You take a swing at something, you see, you learn, you modify it, you go back and do it again. To create ways that we in the church, many of us can be involved with people in our community and to be involved not just this year. It's the difference between having a project and having a long-term focus. Like we could try this project or that project, but to have a focus to say that over the next decade we will become a church that meets the needs of people in poverty in Shelbina. Right? That, that would be what it would take. Our conference leadership is focused on providing the assistance to make this happen. When our bishop, Bishop Farr, uh, became bishop, he did a listening tour around the state, and what he heard was a consistent focus, a consistent desire to, to help local churches figure out how to get involved in, in poverty and helping their neighbors, loving their neighbors. And so what the conference will be doing is, is providing uh, training, such as what Ruby Payne does, what every church member needs to know about poverty. Uh, other uh, things, the, the, church, the conference will be assisting uh, churches in developing developing long-term relationships with schools. They want to quadruple the number of churches that are involved with schools in, in, a, in a real and, and important way. There are ways in which we can um, be involved with... There's a program called Circles, and here's what Circles is based on. you got to create extended family for people who need it. Because when... You, you move and you're down and you're struggling, you need three to four families to mentor and to assist. Someone who can pick up your kid when you go, need to go to a job interview. Someone who can uh, just help you figure out how to budget. Someone who can help you figure out where to get food more cheaply. Right? To have extended family, to have three or four families that can walk with you when you are in need, it's what we all rely on, right? Like, I, I, I rely on that. As I've mentioned, I'm looking at so, shoulder surgery in the coming weeks. Uh, we'll schedule it after Easter. Um, and for some people to have shoulder surgery would be like job threatening. And I'm not worried. Why am I not worried? Because you'll work with me and if I preach with my right arm immobilized sitting down in a chair, it'll be fine, right? And I told Honeywell, like, I don't know how I'm going to get there to preach at Honeywell at 8 a.m., but we'll figure it out. It's not like you're going to fire me because I had a surgery. And that's the type of extended family that we need. If we don't have that extended family, something goes wrong, we go under. But with that extended family, we can get through. How do we create extended family for people who don't have it? How do we create these circles where we bring someone in and become their extended family? How do we help someone? Because what, what happens often is someone will get a job, like stereotypically, I have seen it happen. A mother, a single mother with two kids will get a job. She's doing what she's supposed to do. And as she makes some money, she loses assistance for daycare, and her food stamp allotment goes down. And if she gets assisted housing supplement, that goes away. And then there's this horrible gap between I can live off government for a couple years, and then I can try to get a job, but I can't get through this space to get stable. And the Circles program, their approach to doing this has been proven to show you can double and triple people's income if you have three or four families to walk along with them to, to help make this work. This is what I think of as I read uh, what is a reoccurring theme in Scripture, Galatians, that the whole of the law is fulfilled in loving your neighbor. 1 John 3.16, let us love not with word but with deed. And what is the most loving thing we can do? It is to be family for people who need it. To be the extended family, to have this, to give, and it's something that Jesus doesn't explicitly say, become extended family. Because in Jesus' day, everything was based on extended family. It was just a given. And how do we do that? I don't have any family in this town, but I have this church. And without this church, I'd be in a world of hurt. But with this church, I, I don't worry. Like, if you think, maybe one more way to think about it, think about the way that this church embraces a new pastor when he or she shows up. What do you do? And what could, how could we model doing that for any family who walks in the door. 
As we go down the road, I hope this doesn't fade and just become another sermon series. My uh, preaching professor once reminded us, don't forget, people, that uh, when you've preached a sermon, you've said some words, there are some good words, but that's what you've done, you've talked. I, I, I hope that this does not become just another sermon series, but hopes to be something that does make a difference in, in our involvement in, in the community as we pay attention to how the, the conference leads, as we return to this topic, probably on a regular basis. As we do that, I invite you to be praying and dreaming and paying attention to Scripture and also to our community around us. Like, a quarter of children in this nation are in poverty. That's true in Shelbina, too. Like, there is a real need if we but have eyes to see it. I invite you most of all to hope that we know that the kingdom of God is coming. We know the end of the story. We know lives can change. And I want to leave you with one last story of how lives can change. We read in the third verse of Rescue the Perishing something I think of. Uh, Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Feelings lie buried that grace can restore. I, there was a fellow on the street named Red. He was uh, about 6'5", and he was big. Bigger than anyone in this room, right? And uh, so we went to bring the, our, our friends on the street to a Thanksgiving meal at the church, and everyone was a bit nervous. Not sure how this is going to go. We were in line to get our Thanksgiving meal, and right, Red was right in front of me, and I made a joke. You ever make a joke when you shouldn't make a joke? I did it. I made a joke. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have made the joke. Red thought I made the joke at his expense, and he turned, and he went up. You know that? I have a hard time doing it, but that stance where the shoulders come up, and, and you realize that the next thing that's going to happen is the fist is going to move, and then you're going to be on the floor. Like, I looked up at him, which is not something I do often. I looked up at him and thought, this is it. This is really going to hurt. And uh, I was just paralyzed. I had nothing to say, which does not happen often that I'm speechless. And uh, my friend Dave right there, he stepped in between us. God love him. And looked up as well and said, Dave, or uh, Red, he was just joking. He's jo it's okay. He's, he's joking. Like, this is Red. He is, <laughs> whoo, right? Like, two months later, uh, Red heard a sermon because we're doing worship out on the street and my friend David preached a sermon. And, like, he talked about the types of love in Greek. There's, there's eros, there's a phileo, and then there's agape. And agape is the love you have for another person just because you love them. Not because they've done you right or they've done you wrong. You just love them because you, you have chosen to love them. It's the highest form of love. And so here's this sermon. And the next day, he is panhandling, flying a sign, will work for food, etc. And someone beckons him over and rolls down the window, and he goes up. And the guy takes his crumpled up McDonald's trash and puts it in his hand. Like, he has just turned my friend Red into a trash can. And, and, and Red steps back and, and walks away. And he's telling us about this a few days later. You know those like signs that they put in front of really nice subdivisions, those big brick like signs? We were, we were all shit sitting behind one of those, just chilling. And, um, and, and Red looks at me and Dave, and he tells a story of this. And he says, now Dave, did I use my agape love when I didn't hit him? Yes, Red. You used your agape love when you didn't hit him. And, and I think of Red when it talks about... Uh, Feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Chords that were broken will vibrate once more. If my friend Red can be loved and graced and pulled into a community such that he goes from being like within 30 seconds of clocking his pastor to not taking out the guy who uses him like a trash can, like lives can change. Just got to have grace and patience with people and love them and allow them to love us too. Amen.